So welcome, Matthew. Are you ready? Hello, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to go off the beaten track and explore some Ooh. interesting new wines. So should okay. I crack on? Yeah, please do. Let's That's crack great. on the first one. Great. Good evening, everyone. Thanks all uh, for joining us. I can see in the comments that lots of you have got the wines, which is great. Um, I've, I've actually got all five today because I know that the Society's Greek White 2019, which was billed as the wine to taste today, is, is now sold out. So I've got both the 19 and the 20 and I'll taste those kind of side by side in case, you know, anyone's got the 20 instead of the 19 and people want to know what the 20 is like. Um, so, yeah, let us know what you're drinking in the chat, even if it's something from a different part of the world, which you think is equally exploratory then let us know what it is and if you've got any questions about that then you know we'll see if we can you know help you out and answer some questions cool right so obviously freddie was supposed to be here but unfortunately he can't so i'm going to be talking about his wines as well i'll try and do them justice um i've tried them both already and you know they're, they're really delicious and i see that a few of you have got them as well so should we crack on with the Rota Veltliner. Um, so Austrian wine at the Wine Society has been, you know, absolutely going gangbusters recently. It's we're, we're now selling more Austrian wine than German wine at the moment, which is pretty incredible. Um, and it's been very much off the back, mainly of, of Gruner Veltliner. Um, so it's interesting tonight to taste Rota Veltliner, which, as I'll say in a little bit, actually has very little, if anything, to do with Gruner Veltliner. Um, so a bit of background on where this wine is from. Um, it's, it's a wine from Niederösterreich, which is basically Lower Austria, which is Austria's kind of largest grape growing region. So you can see there it's kind of northwest of Vienna, but the, well, where the winery is is northwest of Vienna, but the actual um, wine region encompasses a huge amount, pretty much that entire picture is is uh, is Niederösterreich and that's broke then it's then broken down into into smaller areas like Wachau and Kremstal and Kamptal and Fagram for example um, and so the area in in total is around 30,000 hectares um, and around here it's predominantly Los which is a soil which is basically a formation of sand and clay and a little bit of silt as well and it, it typically makes quite aromatic quite fresh white wines which is where you know you'll find mainly Gruner Veltliner and a bit of Rota Veltliner around here. The winery itself um, as the name suggests it is very much a family winery. They don't employ anyone else it is literally just their immediate family so they have absolutely no employees and uh, the town here is a little town um, called oh it's called Ebersbrunn yeah it's absolutely minute so there's no shop there's basically nothing there apart from wineries so I think 10% of the population of this tiny little village are winemakers and so albeit that there's no shop or supermarket or anything like that you're never too far away from a drink which is the most important thing I think in a village um and so, yeah, I think we've got a picture of the family in the vineyard as well. Um, yeah, there we go. So I can talk you through the, the, the people. So you've got Carl and Gabby, who are the husband and wife team there. And then you've got Thomas, Maria and Benedict. Now, I don't think Maria actually works at the winery. I think she is working in Germany now. But Thomas and Benedict uh, are kind of the new generation coming through. And they've both been trained at Klosterneuburg, which is the very famous Austrian wine school, which I believe was the world's first wine school. I can't remember when it dates back to, but it's, you know, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. So, you know, they've got some serious stock coming up, um, but they're still tiny, tiny, tiny production. And so, Rota Veltliner, as I've mentioned before, it is absolutely nout to do with Gruner Veltliner. Uh, there was original thought that it was a grandparent of Gruner Veltliner, but I think that theory's kind of gone out of the window now. And it's it's pretty rare. I think something like 10 or 20% of Austria's Rote Veltliner is all grown in and around this village. 
Um, it was planted quite a lot because it's very good in quite, um, oh, what's the word I'm thinking of, quite generous soils um, where, you know, a lot of wines actually just tend to get a little bit flabby and a little bit kind of high yielding. And so it was growing a lot on the low soils there. Um, but it started, got taken, it started to get taken up a lot in replace for, for Grunewaldina, which is a far more popular uh, grape variety in, in Austria. Um, in terms of the wine itself, uh, the grapes are taken from the Reed Sandberg vineyard, which is a single vineyard, which the family own uh, just around the town. And I think Sandberg probably gives a good idea of the, of the soil. So it's very, very sandy soils. As I said, Los is, is predominantly sand with a little bit of clay. In terms of winemaking, um, it's fully stainless steel. There's no oak whatsoever. Um, malolactic fermentation is suppressed. So you should get really nice, zingy, spicy acidity. Uh, and it's aged in tank on the lees, on the yeast lees for, for 12 months, which I found quite interesting actually, because, you know, it's, it's a, a polite way of saying it's, it's an entry level priced wine, you know, it's not, it's not expensive. And so, you know, to have a wine aged on the lees for quite a long time, you know, it takes up a lot of tank space and it's a lot of time where you're not selling the wine and it adds a really nice kind of creamy, textural, bready character to the wine. And Catherine and I, and I were chatting very briefly before we came on here. And although it technically doesn't have anything to do with Grunewaldlina, it tastes a lot like it. You know, Grunewaldlina is is famously in terms of flavors, kind of stone fruits, you're looking at pears and maybe a bit of peach. And it has this quintessential peppery spice. And there's definitely some some spice on, on this, I think. And um, yeah, it's, it's got this lovely textural mouthfeel. It's, it's quite golden in color now. So there's a little bit of fruit development as well. So that fruit has gone from the really kind of bright crunchy pear fruit into a slightly more kind of stewed as maybe a, a bit of a mean way of saying it but it's definitely a, a riper kind of almost slightly kind of bruised pear flavor and that's where you start to get some of the nice spice and kind of oily oily um texture to it as well hmm. it's got a very nice concentration hasn't it i know we were saying how well the yield can be on the soils but they do quite a bit of extensive pruning, don't they, to keep their yield down? Yeah, yeah, definitely you have to. I think Rotoveltlina is one of those grapes that if you leave it to its own devices, it will grow a lot and it will produce a massive crop. And so what you will tend to do is um, you will do a little bit of pruning, um, which will restrict photosynthesis, which will slow down the ripening. And also you might do a bit of green harvesting as well. So you'll, you'll take away some of the, some of the bunches about halfway through the growing season, maybe just before or after Veraison, which is the start of the main ripening period, um, just to kind of get a bit more concentration into those final berries um, and yeah, give the wine a little bit more character. Um, I must admit this is the first and only Rotoveltlina that I've tried, so I don't have too much to compare it to, but I think it's a, a really charming, quite generous, unoaked white wine. Yeah, I agree. And obviously we've said it's, you know, it's relation to Grunewald, you know, it's very tenuous if at all, but I'm a big fan of Grunewald, Lena, And I think if I was looking for something similar, but different that I, I knew I would like within that flavor profile, within that style of wine, this is definitely one that I would go for. And I think, you know, if anyone's watching this and thinking, oh, I do like Grunewald, Lena, definitely give mm. this one a try. Yeah. Yeah. Quite... There you go. I was going to say, I'm quite intrigued by, um, obviously it's had that time on Lees mm -hmm. and we've said it is still quite an entry level wine, but in terms of whether there would be any development with this, it does have a nice seam of acidity. Do you think it's one that could age a little longer? Um, it, I mean, it's not going to fall off a cliff. You're right in that it does have a nice weirdly enough and this is very geeky and technical but I'm, I'm like that the, the ph is actually quite high the ph is kind of 3.7 and so that's that's quite high for a white wine but there is a it's a very because because malolactic fermentation which is the conversion of malic to lactic acid has been suppressed you get a really nice it's like a really prickly acidity and it's a really spicy yeah. acidity which you which you sometimes get 
Um, and so I think that that will, you know, help the wine age better. And I think it will start to go to that kind of oily, kind of lanoliny, sheep's woolly sort of flavour mm. that you sometimes get with aged semillon or sometimes with muscadet, which you age for a little bit. You know, a lot of muscadet is aged on the leaves for a long period of time. And so I think you will start to get those characters. I think, you know, two more years will probably be its limit. I don't know how much enjoyment you get out of it after that, but it will be really interesting to see, mm. you know, where it goes. Absolutely. Mm. Do we have any questions? Well, we've had um, a question, um, a consideration. We're not entirely sure if they mean the height of the vines or altitude, but the question is um, how high are the grapes grown? So obviously we've touched on the fact that they're pruning them. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the physical vine, mm -hmm. do you have anything on that? And in terms of the altitude, is there... I I, I don't know this area inside out, but I'd imagine that it's pretty low. There's not too many mountains in around here. Um, when you start going further west into the Wachau, that's where you start to get a lot of the mountains uh, and mountain viticulture. Whereas a lot of this, I mean, it's neither Osterreich means lower Austria, which I assuming means, you know, the low plains. And so, you know, this is going to be relatively flat land. Um, yeah. Absolutely. The uh, the feet on the label, is there any some relevance to the, the, the feet with this wine? Yeah, well, I think there's the, it's slightly two ways, I think. So <laughs> I, I think their in, main intention with the feet is showing the kind of succession from generation to generation, you know, following in, in kind of your, your family's footsteps. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm according to them, I'm not too sure whether there is true for the white that they do foot treading for for crushing of the berries. So an open top fermenters, they'll get their they roll their socks up or take the socks off. I suppose roll the trousers up, and um, and they'll stamp the berries, which you know is a very traditional way of of, of getting juice out. It's very soft and gentle. Um, you don't see it too often with white wines because. You, typically you want your whites to get into the fermenter pretty quick because of oxygen um but you know if they say they do it sure why not <laughs> absolutely and we've had some uh, questions about what food you would pair with this uh, mm. matthew any any ideas i mean i would i would go with your sort of your typical austrian affair perhaps some schnitzel some lighter meats um, absolutely yeah um and I think you're right with with that that kind of pork schnitzel with the highest well the, the kind of crackly acidity mm. would, um, would work really nicely. It needs something well. It could handle fatty foods for that acidity to, to to cut through definitely. Um, yeah, if you wanted to go traditional Austrian, then you know your 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 classic schnitzel would be would be perfect. Um, other than that, you know, chicken would be classic. I'm I'm really bad at, at <laughs> wine matching. I must admit, I always choose basically what I'm going to eat, and I'm like, oh, uh, that'll be all right. And I just, I'm yeah. I'm, not, I'm not a, I'm not a genius on food and wine matching. So you know, you you probably have a better idea than I do. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously you've got that sort of slightly baked orchard fruit like character to it. So mm. like we were saying, the pork or even something. Um, because you've got that nice sort of peppery white pepper that um, sort of hits there. Something perhaps not quite as traditional. So perhaps um, sort of maybe some like dim sum or something yeah. lighter in that respect. It's got a little bit of fattiness yeah. that will be cut through nicely with the acidity, but the flavor profile will match it or something like that sort of membrio quincy sort of character yeah um so go with that absolutely i think that's a great idea yeah yeah hopefully any other questions on that one or should we pop on to the i think, the green I white? think we are good oh they would like to see a label here is the label yeah that's good at it so sorry <laughs> sorry i forget that not everybody's got all the wines yeah so Super lucky. With the feet yeah David, I like that. It does fit our theme of exploring, doesn't it? Yeah, and and also I should, I should mention it's, it's only eleven point five percent as mm. well. You know, which is which is super yeah. low. I definitely class that as a low alcohol wine. 
We've described it as a lunchtime wine, which I think oh, yeah. is very fitting. <laughs> <laughs> Great. But uh, yeah, what one one thing that was quite interesting, so I'm assuming we're going to go on to the 2020 vintage at some point. The 2020 is very different in terms of its winemaking. So that only spends four months on t in tank on the lees. So look that'd be interesting to will. look out for and see. Yeah, maybe a little bit more fruit forward. Um, who knows? Who knows? Really? I think I think there was a question what someone was drinking the society's Gruner and what the difference is. Um, the main difference is they're from different areas. Um, so this is, well, the Society's Gruner is from Kremstal. It's made by Stad Krems. And Kremstal is a DAC, which is a quality designation, which sits within Niederösterreich. And so if you go along the Danube from Vienna, if you go west, you'll get to a place called uh, Krems under Donau. And it's around there. It's really pretty. I really recommend going. I went. I was lucky enough to go to Austria with Freddie last January, um, and it's so beautiful. It's amazing. Absolutely perfect. Cool. Greek white. Yeah, let's go on to the Greek white. Cool. That one next. I'll, I'll start with the label. <laughs> there you go. We love this label. This, yeah, the society is Greek white. So I'll start by talking about the 2019, because I imagine, you know, the 2019 literally sold out maybe two days ago. And so if you've got it in your glass, you've probably, you've probably got the 19, but I'll say a little bit on the 20 as well, because this is my first trying the 20 since I blended it uh, last month, or maybe just before Christmas, I can't remember. Anyway, Greek white, yeah. So I'm the, I'm the bar of Greece, which is great. So uh, I can say a little bit more detail about this. Um, Greek wine at the Wine Society has been going absolutely bananas over the last year, which is amazing. Sales are through the roof. You know, we've gone from about 0.3% of society sales to about 1% of society sales, which still isn't very much. But, you know, we're, we've more than doubled over the last year, which is awesome. Um, and a lot of it is to do with the Society's Greek White, which was released about July last year. Yeah. Um, so it's made by a winery called Sameli, who are based in Nemea in the Peloponnese. And the Peloponnese is that little kind of offshoot island. It's not an island because it's connected to the mainland um, uh, where you've got Nemea and you've got Sparta and Corinth and, and areas like that. And we've been buying wine from Sameli for, for quite a few years. Um, they do wonderful uh, Moshka Filaro, which is uh, an aromatic grape, which makes up roughly half of this blend. And uh, Moshka Filaro is dominant in the area of... Um, uh, well, my mind has gone completely blank. Um, <laughs> in... Oh my God, uh, from uh, Mantinia, sorry, which is uh, basically where the P in Tripoli is, basically right in the middle there. There's, uh, there's an area called Mantinia, um, which is the PDO for... Moshka Filaro. Um, and yeah, Moshka Filaro is a very aromatic, great variety. It, you might think it has a relation to Muscat because of the name, but it, it's not related, but it is from the same, well, it's from a similar family. And it has that very kind of rose water, lime leaf, very aromatic style. And it's also got incredibly high acidity. It's a really late ripening grape. It's the last harvested grape in Greece, which is quite surprising. Um, and yeah, it's defined by this aromatic nature and super high acidity. Um, so that makes up of the 2019, that makes up 55% of the blend. The other 45% is a great variety called Roditis, which um, is a little bit softer. It's a little bit rounder. It's very much kind of stone fruit driven. Uh, and that plays like a little, as a little foil to the very aromatic Moshka Filaro. Uh, and the Roditis comes from a PDO called Patras, which is on the, the northern coast of the Peloponnese. Um, and so they've got vineyards in both those areas. And uh, we use grapes from both and blend them into the society's Greek white. Uh, we have bought Sameli's um, straight Mantinia PDO Moshka Filaro, which is 100% Moshka Filaro in the past, but then this came along and, you know, it's super delicious. Um, so the winery itself is based in Nemea, which where that red 
kind of dot thing is. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, basically in terms of the winemaking, it's super simple, stainless steel, no oak, nice cool ferments to keep those lovely fresh aromatics. Um, and it's just a really nice, aromatic, easy drinking white wine. And for me, it, oh look, lovely, lovely view. I can only assume that is looking north from their vineyards in Patras, right up in the mountains, um, I'm assuming. Um, but uh, yeah, beautiful. And um, yeah, now this is, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a year into its life and you still get those lovely aromatics. It's possibly not as pungent as maybe it once was. Um, but what has happened, which is very good, is that the acidity softened from the, the Moschka Filaro and, um, and it's just got this lovely, generous textural mouthfeel. Yeah, yeah, generous is exactly how I would describe it. It's, it's a different texture, though, to the Rosa that we've just tried. I feel it's, it's a little bit pithier. There's that grapefruit that I, I get the first sort of hit of mm -hmm. that almost has a bitterness but balanced with the, the, the sort of floral aromatics. It yeah. just really balanced nicely, isn't it? As a, as a, yeah, it's great. We've got some people that are really loving Greek wines. It's an interesting comment that um, Moshe Filaro also works well with skin contact sure. that remains yeah. um, a white wine and not orange. So that might be. Yeah, definitely loads yeah. of loads of phenolics which you get in the in the skins mm. of, of Moschka Filaro and so when you leave um, the skins in the ferment for a little bit or do a cold soak before then you extract loads of that it's probably where that slight bitterness is coming from um, yeah quite bitter um, but yeah it does give good texture and and that kind of bitter character um, but yeah I mean this is the first time I've tasted this wine in, in a little while and it is really really good um, in terms of the the difference between this and the 2020, um, very little. <laughs> and so, uh, I'll, what I'll do, I'll, I'll finish tasting this. Basically, I the label's exactly the same, and so even on the back it says 55% Moschka Filaro, 45% Reditas, but that's actually a bit of a lie. I did tweak it a little bit, but we'd already printed the labels because we we're in such a rush to get the wine kind of bottled and brought in that it's. 57% Moschka Filaro and 43% um, Reditas. And weirdly, mm. I did that because the Reditas was so good in 2020, which might sound a bit strange. Why didn't you put more in it, more of it in? It's because the Reditas are so good that it totally overpowered the aromatics of the Moschka Filaro. Mm. And so I find the 2020 a little less aromatic, um, but a little bit kind of weightier, a little bit more generous. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, Julia said in the chat that like the um, the Smelly Moshe Filaro, this you wouldn't be able to, you would place it nowhere else but Greece. It's got a real sense of place, yeah. which I do agree with. But at the same time, I'm not as familiar with Greek wines as I would want to be. Mm -hmm. Do you think, um, I mean, personally, I think with this one, it's, it's a great one as an introduction to wines that aren't Retsina um, or things that you're not perhaps used to. Do you think that Greek whites and Greek reds as well, that they're really sort of finding their place more at the, the forefront of the, the wine world now? Definitely, definitely. Greek wine is very much the on-trend region at the moment. And I think a lot of it is possibly sommelier-led. And there's a huge kind of, before COVID, unfortunately, the the, the rise of the sommelier was was a big thing in the wine trade and sommeliers really started to become influential people in the wine trade which is great um, and they like food and wine matching of course and they like stories and also they you want something that's bloody good but also when you're charging three times what a retailer would charge it at in a restaurant it's actually still good value and and Greek Greece is very good for that there's seriously high quality wine at you know very relatively pretty pretty affordable prices um and yeah i think there there was there was still the thought that greek wine was retzina and that was it but 
there's there's loads more and people and wineries are focusing more on regionality and on indigenous grape varieties um and so yeah i think um yeah it's it's you know it's up and up and we've done a great job of promoting cinnamavro the red grape and moshka filaro mm -hmm. as kind of the two if you're new to Greek wine, they are two lovely wines, great varieties to kind of get your head into into the game for it, and then you can explore a bit more there. Um, In terms of plantings, the Moshka Filaro, how do you have an idea of how much that is planted in in Greece? As a... no, <laughs> um, it's it's one it's it's one of the most popular. It's one of the what they would, what they would call a classic yeah. variety, and so. You know, it's it's planted a lot, but it's mainly in in and around Nemea and the Peloponnese. It's not, as far as I'm aware, it's not planted too much on the islands or or anywhere else. Um, mm. It's a bit like Cinemavro. Cinemavro is pretty much only in in Nausa, up in the north, up in Macedonia, and a bit in Rapsani, but they're, yeah. they're relatively localized. Um, um, yeah. So the 2020, I've just just tasted it. The 2020 is a little bit more kind of limey, I would say, than 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 rosy. The 19 is is very aromatic. The the 2020 is a little bit more kind of straight down the line, super taut lime, very grippy, a bit more structured, um, and uh, yeah, they're they're, they're surprise they're surprisingly different. You know, we try and blend society wines that they're consistent, mm. but actually. They, these are quite different um, because the Moshka Filaro in 2020 is, was teeth shatteringly acidic. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to go any further than 57 because it was like, whoa. It was yeah. <laughs> and so, um, yeah. I think yeah. that's that's true though, isn't it? It's something to be very much aware of that even though we, you know, with our wines, we do try and blend to have a consistent wine year in year out without too much vintage variation but at the same time that's what makes wine so lovely is that it is a product that is you know susceptible to the vintage variation and that's why we love it because it's such a you know natural product it's yeah. it's agriculture you can't mess with that too much definitely and I think with um you know we say that you know we try and keep it a, a kind of consistent and you know, I think with with let's face it, really important wines like the Society's White Burgundy and the Society's Claret, mm. it is important to have like a consistent style because yeah. you have members who buy it by the caseful mm. year in year out, and you know you want it to taste as good as the last one you had. And so, with whereas with these, I think it's slightly less important. You can you can swing and ebb and flow with the vintages a little bit more and tweak the blends a little bit and. Yada, yada. So, you know, I don't envy Tim Sykes who blends both the claret and the white burgundy because, you know, if he gets that wrong, then he's got a lot of members to ask, answer for. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We've had um, a comment in the chat from, um, who was it from? Let me find out. Oh, Dave, I think it was. David and Anne, they've asked, um, how different is the white on grey, which is 100% Moshka Villaro? Yeah, it's 100% Moshka Filaro. It's, that's the main difference. But so it's far more rosy and rose water and kind of potpourri on the nose. Um, it's possibly, it's probably a little less generous on the palate. Um, I find the Greek white is, is, is quite rich. You know, it's, it's a dry wine. It's only got about two grams of sugar in it, but it's quite a rich wine. It really coats your mouth um, and it's got that grippy phenolics and the reditus gives that weight um and but the musk of the white on gray is is a little bit lighter it's a little bit fresher um i think it's probably lower in alcohol as well a little bit um yeah. but both really delicious wines um the white on gray is absolutely cracking and it's a really very good value for money um but yeah the, the white on gray i think is it a pdo wine i don't think it is actually I don't think it's from Mantini, um, but it's delicious. I'd buy that as well. But I've not tried the 2020 of that yet. So, um, you know. We've had a comment from Paula who has said that the um, cited Greek white sounds like it might not be a wine to keep. 
are there Greek whites that you would recommend keeping or would you recommend keeping this one? Uh, I think with like, it's, I'd say a similar response to the Rotaveltliner. I think you could, but personally, I wouldn't. You know, yeah. I think for, especially for the Greek white, its charm is in its aromatics and this lovely freshness. And I think if you were to leave it a year or two, you'd lose the aromatics and you'd lose the freshness and you'd be kind of like, mm, why have I done that? Um, and so, yeah, I, I was keep, you know, I, I would drink this now. And I think the nine, the 19 will, if you've got a case of 12 of the 19, don't worry, you know, that will be absolutely delicious in six months time when it's hopefully sunny and hopefully we can have people around and we can all enjoy yeah. a glass of wine together. But, um, you know, it's not going to drop off a cliff. The acidity is there, but you might just lose some of that aromatics and then the, the, the fruit might come through a bit, but it's my, my, my best answer is I don't know, you know, this is only the second vintage of the 2020, the 2020 is the second vintage. So who knows? In terms of white Greek whites that will age, the most famous one is Santorini Assyrtiko, mm, which absolutely. I encourage every member to buy. Mm. It's it's not cheap. It's really expensive. The the one that we've got at the moment, the Scatali, I think is about thirty six pounds a bottle, which is a lot. But I've, I, was, I was looking at it the other day, and I was just tasting the new vintage of it, and they said that. 2020 obviously the vintage that they've just had so i've not tried that yet um the yields were back to normal levels and their normal level on santorini for yields sorry this is a massive step away from what we're actually supposed to be talking about <laughs> like... was um five hectoliters per hectare and right. when you consider grand cru burgundy is 35 hectoliters per hectare yeah. you get an idea as to why it's so expensive um, yeah absolutely but, and that will age for, for decades quite happily and just to wrap up on this one, the obviously with the aromatics, you don't want to serve it too cold because obviously we all know that if you have a white wine, you're not particularly a fan of the, the way to get through it is to serve it as ice cold. So yeah. what sort of temperature would you would you recommend drinking this one at? I mean, it's quite refreshing. I wouldn't want to not have it chilled, but personally, I, I took it out of the fridge about I mean it is a cold day today but about an hour before we started and um, I found that that really made the, the aromatics come through yeah. would you agree yeah definitely um I, I think at, at the end of the day a bit like my food and wine matching thing drink wine whatever temperature you want yeah however I for me and sounds like for you as well I wouldn't want this too cold I don't like any wine that's too cold um just because you, know, you, you do lose a lot of the aromatics and I think you also lose a lot of the body and the richness yeah. sometimes when it's too yeah. cold and so what I tend to do and this is you know this is slightly naughty but just pour a really big glass and then you know you can have it cold to start with yeah but you know I don't I don't I don't necessarily do that little bits out of the fridge for maybe half an hour let it kind of warm up a little bit um but uh not yeah not too cold not too cold, not too hot. Look for about, I don't know, 13 degrees. Yeah. 14 degrees. I was absolutely around that. Yeah. Perfect. So, should we go on to our first red? Yeah, sure. Uh, right, what are we drinking? Syrah. Syrah, yes. Uh, okay. And so, yeah, I think there was a, ask, a question asking about what the wine from Santa Reading I recommended was, and that's that's the Hatsidakis Skitali. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, yeah, it's not cheap, but you won't you won't regret it and for that wine definitely don't drink it too cold put it in a decanter for half an hour before you drink it and it will oh, it's amazing it's amazing um right syrah from bulgaria hmm. one of okay. freddy's yeah so this is one of freddy's um and he he said this not me but i agree typically you know when we as buyers for slightly more niche regions, which have lots of indigenous or local grape varieties, we try not to buy international varieties like Syrah, mm. because there's just so, there's a wealth of Syrah around the world that is really cracking value. Um, and so sometimes we just say, let's, we want to buy indigenous varieties. We want to celebrate what that country's best at. However, sometimes, the one or, one or two comes along, which is just, you know, too good to resist. Um, and this is definitely one of them. I mean, Syrah, what is it, 6 95 
yeah. with with genuine Syrah character. Mm. It's very good. Um, okay, Bulgaria. Um, I'll start by saying, if you haven't been to Bulgaria, go. It's awesome. I love Bulgaria. It's beautiful, especially the coast near Burgas on the on the on the on the right hand side there, on the east. Very very pretty. Very nice. Okay. God, let's let's talk about wine. Let's not talk about. <laughs> um, so, in I didn't know this, but in the 1980s, Bulgaria was the fourth largest exporter of wine in the world, which is pretty amazing. Um, it was back when it was under communist rule, and so it was all communist co-ops probably shipping wine to Russia and other areas of, of Eastern Europe. But that's pretty amazing. Um, mm. But then, you know, after that winemaking kind of plummeted but there's a real revolution going along probably wrong choice of words but yes um in terms of winemaking going on in bulgaria at the moment it's it's really exciting there's lots of interesting wine regions um and so this one is from an area called the the struma valley which is right in the southwest of bulgaria it's only about 15 kilometers 10 miles or so from the greek border yeah. so You've got kind of Greece and Thrace right in the top in the northeast. You know, you're only just over the Greek border, which means that you've got a lovely Mediterranean climate here. Mm -hmm. A lot of Bulgaria, where the winemaking is, a lot of it's basically on the southern shores of the Danube. Um, and it's very continental there. So it's super hot during the day. It's very cold at night. Um, and, and you can get pretty heavy, rich, full-bodied red wines. Um, but here... Uh, it's far more Mediterranean, so you get long summers that aren't too hot, and you get long winters which aren't too cold, um, and it means that you can ripen Syrah really well whilst retaining freshness. Uh, and so, yeah, it's fourteen and a half percent, so it's boozy, but Syrah is, you know, a pretty late ripening grape, and I think Syrah, kind of at twelve percent. It's going to be a bit green and a bit astringent um and but you know that's just my point of view um okay so in terms of the the winery itself it's still a family-run winery but it's it's at a bigger scale than than family mantler um it's a family that i believe has had viticultural history going back around 200 years but it wasn't until i think 2013 where they actually built the winery so there you've got Nicola on the left who is the kind of founder and winemaker uh, you've got Melitza who I believe is their daughter and then you've got Lubka on the right hand side there so that's the family um, and yeah I think they built the winery in 2013 uh, it's in the town of Melnik which as I said is in the southwest now Melnik is a, a region town and also a grape variety uh, an indigenous grape variety um, from Bulgaria. It comes in two different types. There's the broadleaf Melnik, which is the good quality one, and then there's Melnik 55, I think, which ain't so good. Um, but, you know, you could probably get some good examples of it. But broadleaf Melnik was one of Winston Churchill's favourite grape varieties, apparently, and he used to order it by the by the battle, <laughs> unsurprisingly, for Winston Churchill. Um, the grapes for this wine come from a single vineyard. It's from a vineyard just outside the Harsovo village. My pronunciation is probably no good here, so I apologise. Uh, and yeah, as I said, very Mediterranean climate, nice, generous fruit, um, but lots of nice cold breezes coming down from the mountain range. I think it's called the Pyrin mountain range just to the north, um, which keeps things nice and fresh and limit any sort of fungal disease pressures etc mm. um let's give it a whiff so um again it's, it's mainly sandy soils low sandy and clay around there um with some limestone which kind of gives freshness and structure uh, but also there's an extinct volcano near there so you might get some kind of volcanic soils as well which give some kind of minerality and spice i suppose um i think Considering how reasonably priced it is, I was very surprised at how well balanced it also is. I know, you know, it is the 14.5% um, alcohol, but the concentration of fruit really did surprise me. And it, it's a very juicy, quite a thirst quenching syrup. Yeah, yeah there's, um, there's, there's lovely, nice acidity to it. There's really nice freshness. There's good 
kind of structure on the palate. And so what's so this wine doesn't see any oak, it's unoaked, stainless steel. Um, but you get the nice fruit tannins, and so you get grip, but it's nice ripe grip and nice ripe fruit. And so yeah, you're right, there's this lovely freshness to it. And it's it's got genuine Syrah character. It's mm. got that slightly um, meaty, leathery, smoky nose to it. It's got this lovely bramble fruit and blackberry and black currant. Um, and you know, I'd, I'd like to think that if you got this in a blind tasting, you'd you'd think it was Syrah, which is yeah. great for for six ninety five. Um, yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I'm spitting today because it's Monday and five wines is too much for me. <laughs> That's fine. We've just had um, an interesting fact from um, Anna behind the scenes oh. um, that Bulgarian Mavrid comes from the Greek word for black, uh, which is Mavro. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's very Dragono. linked there. Here's another great variety on Santorini. Check it out. <laughs> it's also very expensive, <laughs> um, <laughs> as it always is on Santorini. Um, but yeah, I think this is really rather good. Um, and definitely, I don't know if anyone's got both red wines, but I think it's an interesting one to compare with the Bikova coming up next. Mm. Um, but yeah, lovely juicy fruit, really accessible. It would be a, it's a really good food and wine match. Absolutely. Wine. Definitely a barbecue wine. wine. But, oh yeah, barbecue wine, definitely. Mm. Um, would be absolutely perfect. It's got that smokiness um and uh yeah i think it's really rather nice um and so i think someone's just mentioned that they've that they might have the, the wrong wine because there's two there's two wines from philomelnik on the website at the moment and so we've got the broadleaf as well the young and wild broadleaf melnick yeah which i think is a little it's a excuse me personally for me it's a little bit more on the red fruit rather than this one um in a little bit more sort of black and, and blue fruit Yep. Um, but equally delicious. I, I really rate the Villa Melnick wines. Interestingly, uh, Philip Green has popped in the chat that the label says the winery has been ranked 39 in the world's top 50 vineyards. Do yep. you agree? I, I don't know the conclusive list of the top 50 vineyards. I don't yeah. know if you do, Matthew. I, no, I um, don't. I did, um, I did look at that and I yeah. thought, great, well done. But then I was like, I don't know who's voted for it or, or, or who the others are or who the others are but so, um, it's but, definitely yeah. great <laughs> i'm i'm you know I'm, whether it's up there with remini conti and places like that i don't know but um <laughs> you know they, they've obviously done very very well and it's it's one of bulgaria's top wineries and so you know although they've not been around for that long you know they're, they're doing some really great stuff and some genuinely exciting stuff we've mentioned the broadleaf melnick very different style of red wine definitely sort of red wine that you should drink slightly chilled so it's very mm -hmm. kind of raspberry fruit and super juicy and that sort of wine i find it's a bit like some kind of more kind of beaujolais village styles or beaujolais nouveau if you have them too warm like room temperature they just taste flabby and and they lose all their freshness um mm. and so yeah um I think it's should we um we should probably move on to the last one yeah let's go on to the the aldas mm. good yeah i think it's really nice and so I, I'd, I'd chill that as well i've had that on my mm. my window ledge with um the kind of curtain down for an hour or so before just to kind of keep cool and i think it's really nice um okay aldas agree Big of a right. So, so this is one of mine. So I'm hungry buyer as well, which is great. Um, Big of a means bull's blood, um, and so there's there's a kind of it's it's legend really. It's not fact, but they believe that the term bull's blood came from when the Hungarians were fighting off the Ottoman armies, and the Ottomans basically, after getting defeated, ran with their tails between their legs and blamed it on um, the basically fearless Hungarians who had basically their faces covered in kind of this red liquid. And they thought, oh, well, their courage must come from the blood of bulls because, you know, mm. they're mad like bulls. <laughs> uh, but 
in reality, it was, it was they were pissed. They were, <laughs> they were they were hammered, and they just got all their courage from from being a bit drunk. And the Ottomans, being Muslims mainly, didn't drink, and so they weren't aware of this kind of this frenzy that sometimes can can come over people um, when they've had a few too many. So that's t- traditionally, supposedly, where the um, where the term bull's blood comes from. Um, the the, it can be made in two different areas. So this one is from Ega, um, which is kind of up in the northeast of, of Hungary. So if you go northeast from Budapest, basically on the way to Tokai, you will get to Ega, and that's where this wine's from. But it can also be made in a place called Sexard, which is way down in the south, um, in the very, very hot areas of the south near Villainy. Um, the difference is really, um, well, Let's talk about Edgar first, of course. Um, so it was a hugely popular wine, Bull's Blood, in the UK and US, because again, during communist rule, there was mass production of really pretty poor um, Hungarian Bull's Blood shipped off to the UK and US. And it was, it was just rubbish, basically. Most of it was made from a grape variety called Kadaka, which no problems with Kadaka, it does make very nice wines, but it's quite a light, pale wine, and so when made in bulk, it's just super watery, and that's kind of what people thought Bull's Blood was during the 70s, 80s, and 90s, but there's some genuinely really high quality Bikova being made now. The The problem with Bikova is it slightly shoots itself in the foot in the... Um, it has a very high maximum yield limit. And so their max yield is 100 hectolitres per hectare for standard Bikova or Classicus, as it's something sometimes known as. Um, but Bikova Superior, which this is, has a lower limit of 60 hectolitres per hectare, which is still quite high, but you know, most champagnes are around that, if not more. Um, and uh, and then there's one up from that which is um, Grand Superior which is basically the same but a single vineyard um, in terms of aging it has to be aged for a year of which six months has to be in barrel that's for Bicover Superior and Grand Superior the, the standard Bicover I don't think needs to be aged at all might be six months actually six months I think it needs um, and the most important thing with Bull's Blood or Bikova is that um, for this level, for Superior, it needs to be between 30 and 60% Kek Frankos, um, mm-hmm. which is you know, a, a premium great variety in, in Hungary. It's also called Blau Frankish in Austria, for those that don't know it, um, for the lower levels of um, uh, bum, 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 um, bum, bum, of, of Bikova, it's up to 50%. I think. Um, so yeah, this so the base of all Bikova should be Kek Frankos. Um, and the main difference um, between Bikova from Ega and Sexard is that in Bikova, it's mainly blended with um, indigenous varieties or not, well, it's, it's blended with Bordeaux varieties, but also others. Whereas in Sexard in the South, um, it's predominantly blended with Bordeaux varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc and yeah. Merlot because it's, it's very very hot down there it's very continental and so the Bordeaux varieties can ripen really well and so if you're looking at two bull's bloods and you've got Sexard and you've got Egger then Egger is more on the kind of Pinot Noir spectrum it's slightly more floral it's more fragrant whereas Sexard is more robust and fuller bodied and tannic um, so this is made by a winery called Sant'Andrea, who um, are one of the best producers in, in Ega. They make really, really good bull's blood. Um, and I think this is a really good example. Um, it's, to me, it's, it's, quite, it's quite fragrant. It's quite polished. Um, you can tell the difference between the unoaked Syrah and the oaked wine here, because you do get that kind of really sweet cedar spice on the nose um, and you just get a lot more tannin and structure um, absolutely there's so much going on with this one i think obviously that comes from the the blend 
yeah. um, we've said it's sort of the eight varieties. So this is the, the Cac Francos, Merlot, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, Cabernet Franc, and Kadaka. But none of them are sticking out. It's, it's really nicely balanced. Mm -hmm. And for me, the tannins, they're, they are there, but they're quite, I find them quite plush mm -hmm. in that you get that really nice mouthfeel when you're drinking it. I think if I'd been a little bit more prepared this evening, I, I would have decanted it. Yep. Um, I didn't, which I'm slightly regretting, but um, yeah, I think it's it's definitely a, a benefit from decanting. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, this, this, this is a wine that will age and it will age really well. Um, when I bought it, I tasted it, must have been about April last year. And I bought it very much with the knowledge that it would be really great in kind of a year to three years time. And so I think, you know, it's been on sale for a little while um, and it's, you know, it's, it's selling really well, but I would... I would happily tuck some of these away for, for another couple of years because, you know, those tannins are, they're plush, but they are quite prominent. Um, mm. So they are drying, drying your lips out, drying your mouth out. Um, but yeah, I don't know the exact composition of the grapes, unfortunately. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's just a really interesting, quite, it's quite a serious wine, I think. Um, and this isn't to, to dumb down the, the Melnick, but I found that just such a friendly, juicy, accessible wine. This is a little bit more, you need to kind of prepare a little bit for this sometimes, don't you? And um, it will be good with, with food. Um, yeah, I can't reel off loads of Hungarian recipes off the top of my head at the moment, but... Goulash? Yes, there you go. <laughs> Maybe some goulash, some... I mean, you know, if we're just looking a little bit more local stews, yeah. perhaps a low and slow cook would mm. definitely but you say a bit being a more serious wine and I agree it is but on the flip side it's a serious wine and an impressive wine without being um with without putting you off mm. I think it's it's quite um not crowd pleasing you don't want it to be you know the 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 Bog standard, you know, on the side wine, but I don't think it's one that would put a lot of people off that are red wine drinkers. It's um, it's mm. got a really nice balance with the the grape varieties involved. That you get a bit of everything. Yeah, and I think um, it would be a good wine to throw in if if someone is very much a, a francophile and it feels like they they very much like buying french wine and aren't too keen about other things especially if they like burgundy yeah not something this is as elegant or anything as, as burgundy but it's got similar traits to me it's got that lovely perfume it's got the really fine grainy tannins it's got pretty generous fruit um you know it's it's i think it would be a good kind of one to, to throw in to, to to give people something a little bit different um and so yeah yeah absolutely we've had um carry on go oh no i was, I was going to do a little bit of shameless <laughs> another more wine plugging normally i don't look more <laughs> please please do we're exploring massively interested in um in kind of awards or anything like that because you know if i like the wine i'll buy it and hopefully other people like it yeah. but um this I, I was pretty surprised actually that I, I got an email from um, the winery a couple of weeks ago and this wine had won um, on decanter one of the it was named one of the best wines of 2020 and I was like oh okay that's interesting looked at the list of the other wines that were winners in it and I was I was it was incredible. So it was it was a panel of Ronan Saburn, who's the master sommelier behind 67 Palmel, um, uh, da, 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 Beth Willard, who's a, a, a brilliant buyer. I think she was buyer for direct wines, I think. No, I bet she's recently gone elsewhere. And Andy Howard, who's an MW, who was the MS buyer for like 30 years. And the other wines that won, just to pull a few out, Mount Edelston 2015, Inglenook Rubicon, Cullen Diana Madeline, Isole Elena Ceparello, Leville Barton, 
Canon Cop, Paul Sauer. I was just like, mm. wow, this is in pretty good company. Absolutely. All for £12.50. So, um, yeah, I don't normally do that. I don't normally start shouting about trophies and this is one that and yada, 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 because you know, it doesn't interest me that much. But I thought that was pretty cool. Oh, absolutely. I, I agree. Um, it is It is one of those wines that I think, you know, if you present it to someone and say, oh, try this Hungarian wine, it may be quite a a learning curve for them because I think definitely if I said that to, to my friends or um people that were very much I've, I've got a lot of friends that are into wine but they're very much into like French wine or they're very much into Italian wine and the thought of going slightly further afield they do very much poo-poo the idea um whereas this I think it, you know it could knock those those misconceptions out of the park I think there's any questions on, on... we do um on this one let's just stick on this one slightly um so william pevler has asked whether the pinot noir is a popular blending agent or is it quite unique for um blending in, with... in hungary yeah i'm imagining in hungary yeah, yeah it's certainly in, in egger it's used quite a lot because there's quite a lot of limestone um and so limestone and clay basically makes up most of burgundy and so obviously that's where the best pinot noir is made uh, and so it's quite a well grown variety in hungary outside of that you you'd be hard pushed to find pinot noir blended with anything other than in champagne of course you don't normally blend it with anything um because it's pretty good on its own um but yeah here in, in egger it's 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 grown quite a lot if we go back to some of the other wines, I'm just double checking the um, questions we've got coming in from Anna. Uh, this one's a, a nice one about the, the Greek wine. Um, can you explain our role? So the society's role, but pretty much your role really in blending the Greek wine. How, how do you go about that? How do you work? Um, in so it's, it's, quite, it's quite a simple one for the, for the Greek white because it's a, so Freddie might he previously bought Greek wine he blended the first vintage and they basically smashed it out of the park with that one and so obviously I wasn't able to travel to Greece this year to, to blend this one so instead I got a sample of the exact blend but from 2020 and then I got um, a bottle of straight Moschka Filaro and a bottle of straight Reditas and then I got my own little little blending tubes and um and uh, and basically did a bit of tweaking and kind of put together what I thought was the, was the best blend of, of those two great varieties and so I tweaked it a little bit but yeah that's how it goes with with, with that so it's quite it's quite it's quite an easy one. Excellent I think a uh, question perhaps just to, to end on seeing as we've gone a, a little bit around um, Eastern Europe is from Michael Betteridge and he's asking where in Eastern Europe is perhaps most underrated in your opinion? Greece. <laughs> definitely definitely uh, agree yeah without doubt but you know it's getting there it's getting there i think the the wealth of indigenous grape varieties and regions you know it's it's going through what italy went through in the 70s and 80s is a serious wine revolution and people uh, are really starting to, to take notice and you know in, in 30 years time greece will be as 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 popular as italy is at the moment you that. heard it here first <laughs> and I'm looking forward to that I'm, I'm really enjoying the the Greek wines that we're getting on the list if you are very much enjoying uh, Greek wines Matthew you are doing a deep dive on Greece for us at the end of March I think we've popped the exact date in the chat but um, do have a look on the tastings calendar on the website so we've got a lot of new and interesting events coming up but thank you Matthew for that introduction to those four Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Um, I hope everyone joining us this evening did too. And um, it looks like we may have had some some questions that we might not have been able to get to, but I think perhaps we'll be able to tackle those um, behind the scenes, Matthew, and get some answers emailed out on some of those. I'm assuming we can't just answer them now because people need to go off and have their dinners or <laughs> people on their way out. Yes, but okay. um, we can definitely take a look at those for you. Okay, and we'll get those this answered popped out to you but thank you again and thank you Matthew for joining me no problem thanks Catherine thanks everyone thank see you soon. cheers bye